Okay, let's start. So, hi, my name is Alexei Soshin. I'm a solution architect at Depop. And today we are going to talk about our approach of writing backend for frontend services with Kotlin. I, I would like to discuss different kinds of uh, architectures, including the backend for frontend architecture and why Kotlin adoption may be beneficial for you. If you never heard about Depop, we are a marketplace for fashion and part of the Etsy family. We have 20 million users globally. In the engineering, we are about 100 engineers at the moment. Uh, our product consists of 200 microservices, which are mostly written in Scala. We support three different platforms, iOS, Android, and web. This information should help me explain why we choose backend for frontend architecture and how it supports our product. But before we can discuss backend for frontend architecture, we need to discuss key differences between other architectural patterns and when those are useful. So let's start with the monolith. Imagine that you, like Depop, have three different clients you need to support, iOS, Android, and web. When all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. When all you have is a monolith, all the clients can talk only to the monolith because you don't have anything else. The benefit of that architecture is simplicity. You don't need to concern, concern yourself where to put your next feature. You put it in the monolith. The problems are that a monolithic code base means lots of code, lots of dependencies, lots of endpoints you need to maintain. Your deploys take very long, your tests take even longer. Even your backend developers may not like working with it. And your frontend developers usually don't want to touch this monolith at all. So if you decide to split your monolith into microservices, the problem only worsens. First, you still have your monolith, and you will have it for a long, long time. But now, all your different clients also need to keep track of all the microservices you are adding. So every time you add a new microservice, you potentially need to change three different clients. Those clients also may have different release cycles. Usually, mobile clients are released weekly or biweekly, and your web clients may be released continuously. That adds a lot of complexity and opportunities for bugs, and it introduces tight coupling between your backend and frontend. Also, those microservices may be written in languages that your frontend developers still may not be familiar with. So that's another problem. Constantly changing your clients by adding new endpoints may quickly become a problem. A common way to solve this problem is to add an API gateway layer. API gateway is basically a reverse proxy. It may be a service you created or some open source solution that you configured or something your cloud provides. In any case, this is a single entry point for all your clients. The benefit is that now there is no need to add new hosts to your, cli to your clients constantly. The disadvantage is that usually your front-end developers need to learn a new language to be able to make even small changes to this layer. This is similar to the problem we had with the monolith. And that means that to deliver any kind of feature, no matter how small, you would need to support, back, uh, you would need support from backend developers. In some extreme cases, this API gateway layer becomes yet another monolith, smaller in terms of business logic, but still with hundreds of endpoints that you need to maintain. Here is where the backend for frontend or simply BFF architecture comes into play. The idea is that instead of having a single API gateway, we would have a gateway for each client. One for iOS, another for Android, a third one for web. The benefit of that approach is that each frontend team 
can choose the technology and protocol that works best for them. For example, the web gateway could be developed in TypeScript and use GraphQL, Android gateway can be developed in Kotlin and use REST, and since Swift on a backend is not really a thing, you may decide to use Go and WebSockets for iOS. That approach allows uh, your front-end developers to own parts of the backend infrastructure. It reduces the cost of contact switch because they can work in the language and protocol most suitable for them. The disadvantages of that architecture is that it, it's it has quite a lot of code duplication. If your iOS, web, and Android front-end applications have similar screens, you'll have to implement their APIs three times in different languages and maybe protocols. For that reason, although we have three clients at Depop, we decided to split our BFF layer into two parts instead of three. So we have web gateway and the mobile gateway. There are a few reasons for that. First, as I mentioned, we had to find an alternative for Swift on the backend, and Kotlin is the closest language in terms of idioms and features. Second, iOS and Android screens and user behavior are very similar while web experience is more optimized for occasional users in our case. For example, on web, most of the features don't require a user to be logged in, and we have less personalization as the result. So that's why we decided to keep iOS and Android BFFs together and web separate. With that architecture, we enabled our front-end developers to make small changes on the backend without the need of backend developers to support them. So let's talk a little bit about Kotlin. Uh, originally, our web gateway was written in TypeScript, and the mobile gateway was written in Scala because that was our main backend language. The web gateway part worked really well. Web developers were able to add new features efficiently. The mobile gateway was a different story. Mobile developers struggled to make changes in the Scala codebase. In an attempt to solve that, we decided to rewrite the new mobile gateway layer using Kotlin, thus implementing proper BFF architecture. So there are a few benefits of why we chose Kotlin. Kotlin is a modern language. That means that you have functions as first-class citizens, higher-order functions on collections, friendly generics, and many other nice features. Kotlin is type-safe, which means that you spend less time figuring out what your API returns. And more importantly, it is also null-safe. Null safety is a killer feature uh, for Kotlin. It is very, very hard to get a null pointer exception or some ki other kind of the reference in Kotlin. The compiler will catch most of those situations. It has the concept of suspending functions built into the language. So the language is concurrent by default. For Depop, it was also very important that it's an JVM language, so we can use the same libraries we already developed for Scala with some minor changes. And speaking of Scala, Kotlin is simpler than Scala, and Scala complexity was one of our main pain, pain points in hiring. For Android developers to be able to work on the backend, this is really a no-brainer. They already know the language, so it's almost effortless for them to become productive. For iOS developers, this is mostly anecdotal evidence, but from what I can tell, they also found Kotlin to be quite similar to Swift and easy to adopt. <coughs> Picking the language for the BFF layer is half of the task. The other half is to select a web framework. We chose Kator since JetBrains themselves develop it, 
so it has the best Kotlin support. It is idiomatic, so you can write your code in the way it's meant to be written in Kotlin and not trying to adopt patterns from Java, Scala, or some other languages. Kator is built around the Coroutines library, so it's highly concurrent, which is important since your BFFs will be handling thousands of requests per second. And as a bonus, Kator is both a server and a client framework. For BFFs, you will need to call downstream services, so it's good that you don't need to worry about compatibility between server and client libraries. Well, this is a short talk, so let's summarize. First, think well on what your system looks like in order to adopt the correct architecture. Don't just try to blindly mimic what other companies are doing, because they may have different challenges from what you have. If you don't have scaling issues, maybe Monolith is right for you. If you just have the web client, you probably don't need BFF architecture, and you may not even need API Gateway, to be honest. BFF architecture really shines when you have multiple front-end clients and you would like your front-end engineers to be able to quickly introduce small changes in the backend. Those may include fetching some additional data from the existing services, hydrating your responses with more information, or doing some simple logic like filtering. For BFF, Kotlin and Kator are great choices because they allow you to develop type-safe, null-safe, and highly concurrent services easily. It is important to keep your BFF layer simple to be able to make changes easily though, so try to avoid having any kind of state in it. Don't integrate it with databases, message queues, and such. Try to keep it simple. So that's it for today. Uh, if you'd like to stay in touch, here are the links to my medium where I write about architecture, links to my Twitter, and also to the Udemy course I published on system design, which is bestseller on Udemy. Uh, I also have a book on Kotlin, which is sold on Amazon. If you are interested in design patterns in Kotlin, please check it out. And last but not least, glory to Ukraine. Thank you for, uh, so much for coming to my talk and enjoy the rest of uh, your conference. Thank you very much. Uh, if you'd like any questions, I'm here, so please come after the talk. Thank you.